sleep again. So, come on. All right, now, let's see. Are found in the Bibles? We're in the Gospel of John in chapter 20. I'll begin reading there with verse number one of the chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linens, wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside, and he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stood and stopped and looked in, and she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Lord has sent me, so I am sending you. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. Did you know that the average human being can live about three weeks without food, about three days without water, and approximately up to three minutes without air? But how long can a person live without hope? without purpose, without meaning. They may be able to eat and drink and breathe, but are they truly alive? The philosopher Henry David Thoreau once said that most men live lives of quiet desperation. Jesus came so that that did not have to be the case. Today, we gather to celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which gave to each one of us the ability to know God and to have life in Him, to have meaning and purpose and hope. That Jesus Christ came, born and as a baby in a little stable, growing up in pretty much obscurity, to one day go to the cross to die for our sins. He came to flip the status quo on its ear. Because if we're honest, right, most of us know that human nature by, by its nature is a little bit selfish. Most of us have probably had moments where we and other people have manipulated people and situations in order to get the outcomes that we so desired. We want those results. We want to be something that the world values, right? And so we try to accumulate money. Uh, because money is often a sense of security. 
Uh, we pursue uh, power and influence because it makes us feel comfortable to get our own way. And most of the time we resist changes to those things um, because we want to keep our world the way we've made our world. And people were the same in Jesus' day. Even the people that were supposed to be representing and talking for God, the religious teachers, those, uh, the Pharisees of the day, the outwardly they would appear that they were good and righteous, but inside their motivations longed for recognition, to have others pat them on the back, to look at them and say they were really good. They wanted, you know, the praise of people, but inside their motives were fairly corrupt. Jesus actually described them in uh, Matthew 23, 27 in the following way. They're whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Ouch. When I hear words like that spoken, it makes me want to take a good hard look at myself. See, where, where have I been a hypocrite? Where's my own hypocrisy? Because Jesus disturbs our comfort zones. He challenges us on our selfishness. He exposes the motivations that are deep within us. Because Jesus is like a mirror held up in front of us. And we see ourselves as we truly are. And sometimes we might not like what we see. And so when we look in the mirror, we're forced to make a decision how to respond. We can choose humility. Wow, <laughs> I guess I didn't see the ugliness in me before. Or we can choose hypocrisy. Jesus is calling that moment of self-examination for all of us. But that old liar will whisper in our ears, hey, it's fine. You're good just the way you are. Besides, you probably didn't do anything wrong in the first place. Just deny, get away with it. The problem is God sees all and he knows all. So the wiser thing, of course, would be to repent and turn to the God who's loving and caring because Jesus asked us to repent, which means to turn back to him, to surrender to him because he'll change us from being people who are rebelling against God, seeking our own way all the time, doing whatever we want to people that want to serve God, to know him, to love him, to do what he wants us to do. So how did the Pharisees and the scribes respond to the message of Jesus? Well, they didn't choose humility. Instead, they chose hypocrisy. They got self-righteous. They justified themselves. How dare Jesus say anything to us? Doesn't he know who we are? Doesn't he see all the good things? Bum, 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 puffing themselves up like a little air thing, that never admitting their own faults, never admitting that they too had problems. That's sort of the central area of our lives, isn't it, that most of us face? Do we have everything perfectly under control? Are we perfectly good? Or do we need God to come in and help remove the things that aren't so good in our lives? Do we try to do everything on our own? Or do we say, God, I, I need your help? Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter 8. We just covered this in Bible study the other week, which you're all invited to on every Wednesday night. Um, we're studying the Gospel of Mark. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. If you seek to keep your own life, to seek your own will, to do whatever you want, eventually your life will end. And what have you gained? But if you seek doing what God wants, you gain everything. You gain knowing the God who made you and loves you and designed you. See, so many times we, we, listen, we, we have that choice, right? But we listen to that old whisper in our ear that says, hey, you can turn to God later. Don't worry about that today. Plenty of time. Just turn that knob off. Distract yourself with something else. I know inside you feel like that turmoil that God is calling you. He's pushing you. He wants you to do something. But flip the channel. Think about something else for a while until that goes away. Well, the problem is that later never comes. We keep pushing God away and keep pushing Him away. Why put it off? 
What, what are you losing by coming to God? Besides the honor of knowing Him, the God who made you and loves you and created you and designed you for a purpose, who gave you a reason to be alive, it's not just a ticket later to say, hey, here's my ticket to get out of hell. Let me in the gates of heaven. And like, that's not enough, which it clearly is. But he gave you the right to be alive right now. To know that every moment you're alive, God has a reason, a purpose, a design for something that you uniquely are called to do. And your life is so much better when you seek God and you do those things. That's why we gather together the first uh, day of the week on Sundays to worship the resurrected God who is so good. If we go back to that first morning, we see that in our text that was the women who went there to anoint Jesus' body, which right there shows you how different Jesus was. And in the day of Jesus, there were many people who would pray every single day to say, thank God I am not born a woman. Ugh. But in Jesus' day, he said, oh, yeah, you can follow. You can learn. You can teach. You're valuable. You're not less. You're important. He shared his life with them. And so these women, in gratitude, they come to anoint Jesus' body. But when they arrived, Jesus wasn't there. And they were confused until the angel, you know, says to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Still a little confused, but... They figure out what's going on and they find out that it is Jesus and they tell the disciples uh, about what they've realized. And then the disciples meet Jesus, even though they were still a little confused, a little concerned until he appeared to them. And he showed them how real he truly is, that he died for them and took their sins. Think about someone who's done something really good for you. Everyone think of someone? Something they sacrificed for you, right? Something that they did that helped make you and shape you into the person that you are. Don't you like that person? Don't you have fond memories of that person? Don't you want to make that person proud? Don't you want to follow in the footsteps of that person? How much more could someone do than what Jesus has done? He literally, we could have been given a death sentence, but he took our place. Doesn't that fill our hearts with appreciation and love? Now, I know some people over the years, sometimes people will say to me, well, actually, it makes me feel pretty guilty to know that my sin sent Jesus to the cross. Well, when we think about that guilt, yeah, I guess we are guilty of that. I guess we did send Jesus to the cross. But that's how good Jesus is. We don't have to live in that guilt. That even though my sin and your sin helped contribute to what drove Jesus to the cross, he's willing to say, I forgive you. Repent. Turn away from selfishly seeking yourself and seek my way. It's better anyway. It truly is. He's that loving. Don't you just want to know more of that Jesus who loved you that much? You know, I think about on that first day when he came into the room with his disciples. What does he say to them when he sees them that they would believe? You know, he tells to them peace. And even then, the disciples were still unsure a little bit. They were, they were, there was a little bit of trepidation. They were hiding. They were scared of those who might do the same thing to them as they had seen or heard what had happened to Jesus. But Jesus tells them peace to you. The same thing he had told them numerous times. He told them when they were on the boat in the storm and they were afraid of drowning. He said, you know, peace to you. Peace be still. On the Last Supper, when he was gathered together on Thursday, you know, he talked to them about, my peace I leave to you. And here, when he sees them again, he reminds them of this peace. Sometimes, though, probably each one of our lives doesn't feel at peace. There's probably moments where we have pain and grief and worry and trouble and concerns. And those things kind of, they sort of overwhelm us at times. Now, we can focus on the problems and difficulties and tribulations of this world if we want. But wouldn't it be far better to focus on Christ? 
being the solution to those things. It doesn't mean your life's always going to be easy or great. You're still going to have difficulties and problems. But now, there's someone who is always with you in the middle of those problems and difficulties. We're always going to have some sense of fear, or dread, or pain. But now you have a God who is with you. That you don't have to live in that alone. You see that the disciples aren't really scolded. Jesus isn't mad about them over their lack of doubt. He doesn't scream at them initially about how they weren't there with him at his crucifixion, how they ran away at his arrest. Instead, he simply says, Why do you doubt? Behold my hands and my feet. It is me. He shows them the evidence. And their hearts melt away in love and appreciation, perhaps also tended with that sense of guilt and shame about what they had done. But friends, don't we only really doubt and have anxiety about the things that we are actually concerned about? The things that actually mean something to us? You know, because doubt or anxiety is about certain things is not really the enemy of faith. Apathy is. And you just don't care. But when you care about something deeply, sometimes it fills you with a sense of dread. But how often in those senses of dread and those bad times did God give you grace? When you think back on your life and think of when you were in some pretty rough times, when God was with you, and you remember how good He was to you in those moments, he grants us wisdom. It's my opinion probably that whenever we experience doubt and God just looks at and smiles at us, those who are true believers, and he says, now I just get to bless them by showing them the full extent of my love so that their faith will even grow more. I heard a story once about a doctor, probably not a recent doctor, you'll see why, but probably back in Victorian times, we'll say. And... Uh, this doctor always brought his dog with him. And so he's making a house call. He leaves the dog outside, and, but he's going to see a very sick man. He's examining him, and as he's examining him, the man realizes that um, it doesn't look very good. And so the man asks the doctor, Doc, what's it like to die? Just then, the dog that had been waiting outside starts knocking at the door not not like that but you know bumping into it you know um, trying to get in and he says uh, you hear that that's my dog now he's never been in your house before he doesn't even know what's on the other side of this door he just knows one thing about this door that his master's on the other side and if he gets in to be with his master, well, everything's going to be okay. Death is like that. When you know Jesus Christ is your master, your Lord, and your Savior, you might not know everything that's on the other side of this life, but you know the master's there. And so everything's going to be okay. And we have that because of what happened on Easter. Now, someone out there might be thinking, hey, it's easy for you to say you're the pastor, right? You're supposed to say all this stuff. In fact, people are actually giving you a little bit of money to do this. So it's kind of like expected, right? And so, hey, man, maybe you just want people to come hear you and like you and stuff like that. Or maybe all this God stuff ain't that real. And maybe you're just up there faking it. And you say this, and then on Tuesday you say something else. I want to tell you, God is real. I'm a sinner just like everyone else. I've let God down. I am not better than anyone. I need a savior because I've rebelled against God in my life. Because no one's perfectly good. Sometimes I fail. But God has never failed me. That's not because I'm special. It's because God is special. It's not because I love God first. He loved me first, and He loves all of you first. And He wants to demonstrate that the things that this world values are not the things that He values. He doesn't care what you look like. 
He doesn't care if you gain two pounds this week. He doesn't care how much money you have in your bank account. He doesn't care if you're a great polished speaker or you can dance tap or if you're a wise inventor of so many other things. He appreciates those things because he gifted many of them to you, but that's not why he loves you. He values you because he made you like a most beautiful piece of art. He took his time designing you before the creation of the world. He's like, I know exactly how tall Mike's going to be, and I know exactly the number of hairs on Linda's head. I even know the number of hairs on Rich's mustache. I know every single thing about you because I designed it that way. Because I love you. Not the things that this world values, but the things that God values. Now, often when people hear about their value to God, it's been my experience, at least, that they respond in three different ways. The first of those is that some people say, hey, I'm good enough without God. You know, I mow my grass every week. I pay my taxes. All right, I got a flag. All right, so get off my back. I'm as good as anyone else. I'm, I'm average. Well, good, you're average in sin. Guess what, average ain't good enough. God's standard is an average. God's standard is perfection. And any honest person knows you don't meet that standard. So don't try to justify ourselves about our own goodness because we're not as good as God. So humble ourselves and admit that we need him. But some people will respond and say, well, I'll never be good enough. I've done too many bad things. You don't know some stuff I did. I can't change. I can't change the past. I can't change my identity. I can't change what I am. Well, in a sense, you're probably right too. You can't change who you are, not on your own. And you'll never be good enough on your own, but God looks past all that and he sees what he made you to be and he loves you and he cares about you. He sees what the world did to you. He knows all the hurts, the pains, the abuse that inflicted on you by, from other people or even that you may have inflicted on others. And when he looks at that, he says, I love you and I'm going to clean you up and I'm going to make you better than you ever thought you could be. Your identity isn't what you think it is. That's only what you think it is. God's a little bit smarter than us. He sees the way in the future of what you can be. And he's working on shaping you to become that. You can change because God changes people. He has changed some of the worst of the worst. People worse than you. And he can change you. Lastly, though some people say, oh good, this Jesus sounds good. I want some of this Jesus. And uh, that's good because Jesus wants some of you. In fact, Jesus wants all of you. Because he's tired of seeing you suffer in this life and flounder around. He wants to give you direction and purpose and meaning so that you know what to do. But the fact is, still remains, God hates sin. He doesn't just like get a little peeved off about it. And like, it's an inconvenience to him. He hates it. And so the bad news is we have it. We've had sin and we continued to sin. So we need to get rid of it somehow. Well, that's the good news of the cross. He'll remove it as far as the east is from the west. You can't get farther than that, right? You matter to God and he wants you to pursue him, to know him. Because the truth is, you don't even have to really pursue God. Because if you looked back, God's been pursuing you the whole time. And he's never stopped. You just have to accept the offer. You've never run so far from God that he's not right behind you saying, eh, still here. See, the worst thing that God could ever choose to do this side of eternity is just say, hey, do whatever you want. I don't care. Because then you live with the consequences of sin in this world and in the one to come. And you hurt yourself and you hurt the people around you. And to be frank, if you still think, I don't need God, let me ask you a question. How's, how's everything in life working out for you? Everything seem perfect? You're way happier than you were a year ago, five years ago? Are you at perfect peace and harmony with every aspect of your life? Have you feel like you have every single purpose down packed? It, 
if you can't say resounding yes, then how about give God a chance? He already knows the future. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about everyone else that's around you. So why not seek Him? He'll give you that purpose, that meaning. He'll show you what to do. And it, sometimes you might fall down or you might take a misstep and you fall in the muck. He'll help you back up like a little toddler trying to walk. He's like, yeah, I've been there before. Help you back up. Keep walking until your legs are strong enough. That's who God is. That through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you, every one of you, may know purpose and meaning. And you may experience hope that this stuff that's going on right now in your life isn't all there is. There is something so much bigger that there is a world beyond this world to know Him for all time. But it's not just waiting to get to that world. It's right now today that God said, I got a purpose for praise and I got a purpose for Sue and I got a purpose for Terry and I got a purpose for Frank. And everyone on this side too. And the rest of you over here. Because <laughs> He loves you. And He cares about you. And He wants to bless you because your life can be a blessing to God when you obey Him. And you will bless the people who are around you. And if you don't know how to do that, just say to God, hey, I am sorry. And you mean it. And you ask Him to come in and save you from your sin because you're like, I can't be all puffed up in pride anymore. I know I need you, God. And I need to be humble before you. And when you are humble before God, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. That means everything that wasn't right that you ever did. And He'll forgive you. And He'll help you. And then He'll help you to grow to know Him. Because He loves you and He wants you to know the life that He created you to have. Let's pray. Father God, there is always victory in the name of Jesus Christ, for you have defeated death, and today is the celebration of that victory over the eternal separation that we cause by our sin. But you have offered this gift to us, as you did to every generation that has come before, to all those who will come after, that we may know you, who made us and loves us, that you look past our doubts, our moments of self-hate, our moments of worthlessness, moments where we listen to lies in our hearts, where we even may have listened to ideas of even ending our own life. When we fill our hearts with hate and resentment, you've seen our past, you've seen drugs and drinking and sex and porn and you know, everything. You've seen everything we've ever done, the worst of the worst things, and yet you loved us, you loved the real us, you loved the one you created us to be, and so let's be brave. Father, help us to have courage. Help us to place our trust in the God who loved us, who died for us, who conquered death to give us life. May our hearts be full of love and gratitude for you, our Savior. And may we always seek to serve you as Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.